The death of George Floyd has brought the discussion of race in America to the forefront in a new way. That's why tonight we're launching a new series. Our Brandy Powell will begin reporting these in-depth stories tonight on conversations about racism and the road to equality. Brandy. Jackie, in this remarkable moment in history, we're doing this project to inform and inspire. We're talking to Minnesotans of all walks of life who are sharing stories about their experiences with racism. And we explain systemic and institutional racism. Our conversations are candid. Bring me back to the first time you remember experiencing what in your mind you thought of as, as racism. That's a really tough question. Uh, I would honestly have to say it's something that I've always been aware of, always, since I could say my name. Clarence White says there was no mistaking what racism was. I stopped bringing the stories home. Um, you know, you can't have your parents coming into the school every week. My mother was very, very afraid to send me off to kindergarten. She was very worried. Why? Because she was afraid of what would happen to me, how I would be treated. This was in St. Cloud? Yes, in St. Cloud. There are so many layers and ways that that gets internalized. We are born into the society. We walk through it, learning certain boundaries, um, but they always exist. The first time I saw racism, I wouldn't say that I understood it. We met up with Chelsea DeArmond. She's 45 years old. For the first 20 years of my life, had very little exposure at all. So for the first two decades of your life, really you were around other white people. White people, yeah. And everything I knew about black people I learned from TV. There was a lot about crime and about black people and drugs and gangs. Did that in any way shape how you saw black people moving forward when you started to meet black people yourself? Yeah, yeah. In which ways? Um, it made me scared and nervous. And um, it's a feeling that I, I still have. And I, I can um, catch it and say, this makes no sense. Um, but it's there, and that makes me really sad. And now I, I don't want to cry white tears, so. Chelsea admits she's come a long way. Same with Eddie Wu. He took his wife's last name. They own Cook St. Paul, a restaurant on the city's east side. Eggs all daddy. I'm the whitest human being on the planet. 99.8% uh, Northern European. Like Chelsea, Eddie says as a young person, he couldn't quite put his finger on what racism was. How were you raised? Was race talked about? Was racism talked about? My experiences with racism growing up, I didn't realize I was experiencing racism or like what the systems were set up or the things I was hearing were not just inappropriate, but abhorrent. You would hear things being said, but you wouldn't necessarily question them. People just said, and no one questioned. All those white people were also um, um, compliant with what was happening. There was, they were not standing up and saying, well, why would you say that? So for me, my experiences with racism were more about like the systemic racism, racism that I didn't understand until I left. Help us understand what is systemic racism? That's uh, an important uh, question because typically we don't think systemically uh, in this society. We think about individuals. University of Minnesota professor Dr. Rose Brewer. In this system, which is heavily racialized, groups of folk, in this instance, African Americans have unequal access. A lot of white people are hesitant to claim white privilege. Historian Dr. Peter Ratcliffe and co-executive director of the East Side Freedom Library in St. Paul. What does it prevent people of color from doing in well, 2020 I, right, Minnesota? That they don't have the access to generations of success, generations of of formal schooling, generations of property ownership. So they're, they're starting out with a material disadvantage. 
So we're talking about something that's deep, that's pervasive. Associate Uh, Professor of African American and African Studies at the U of M, Dr. Keith Mays. There are people who would say, you know, this is not happening in present day America. Systemic racism is born out of an experience of oppression, specifically racial oppression. Systemic means long time, over time. Uh, Institutional means that racism is embedded in every single major institution in the United States. There are people who say we, we don't actually need change, that th- this is not something that is pervasive in American life. Right. What do you say to that? I say look at the documentation, look at the evidence, look at the disparities, health care, incarceration rates, income levels, educational levels, graduation rates, representation in corporate America, nonprofits, uh, home ownership, uh, who can be an entrepreneur, um, mortality. Where do we actually see that illuminated in present day society? Well, institutional racism is really the way structures from government to corporations um, to banks basically made decisions. Secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, Lonnie Bunch, one of the most prominent museum historians in the country. So in essence, Part of what institutional racism is, is that as the government evolved, as the community evolved, there were decisions that were made based on race that then became institutionalized in our systems. Things that are deeper, researchers say, than racial slurs. If you call me the N-word and you're white, um, of course that has a negative effect. But if you keep me from a job, if you keep me in a certain neighborhood, that's completely different. Uh, One is prejudice that's born out of a certain kind of discrimination. The other one is systematic, it's institutional, it's longstanding because it has um, effects on the way I live my life. And Mohammed Mahadi Ahmed says it's affected his life. All of a sudden he just yelled at me, you know, know, insulted me. My experience is not different from um, the experiences of many black men and women young and old. It's not separate from the general experiences of you know, every person of color in this country. Minneapolis has been his home since 2015. I could say I've experienced it in a subtle kind of ways, less aggressive, because we are in Minnesota nice. Sometimes I get to be followed around for no reason. It's something Laura Mayo calls an injustice. I am still moving through this space with a certain protection around me. What do you mean by that? This skin color gets me a lot of places. That should make any white person mad. We should be peeved about it. We need to educate ourselves on what this is. And that takes lots of work. And it's just the beginning. The beginning of what they say could be change. I hope so. I am hopeful, but I'm not always optimistic. What do you mean by that? Why not? Because we've seen moments like this before. What I so found so powerful about African-American history is African-Americans believed in a country that didn't believe in them. And yet they dreamed of freedom when there should have been no reason to believe that slavery would ever end. They believed that there would be civil rights. And yet the world was so driven by segregation that why did they believe? Secretary of the Smithsonian Lonnie Bunch saying they believed because he says they hoped change was possible, Jackie. Powerful work you're doing, Brandy. And what surprised you most about these conversations? You know, Jackie, everyone's honesty. These are tough topics, but they said their willingness to open up to me for them was really important. How so? Well, you know, some of the people I spoke with, they said their perspectives, how they treat people, the ways they're grappling with what the road ahead could look like has dramatically changed. They said they thought by sharing their experiences now that it was critical in this moment in time that, Jackie, we're all navigating together. We certainly are. And did any of the people that you spoke with talk about how George Floyd's death impacted and affected them? You know, some of them explained what happened to George Floyd has changed their views on injustices. Others told me it invigorated their belief that black lives matter. Eye-opening conversations, certainly, Brandy. We'll be bringing you these in-depth stories as this series continues. We have more resources at KSTP.com. Go to Conversations About Racism and the Road to Equality, Jackie. Brandy Powell, thank you.